afternoon, everyone. It's one o'clock, so we might make a start with the introductions. My name is Duncan Longstaff. I'm a principal at Spruce and Ferguson Lawyers in Sydney, uh, specialising in intellectual property, and I'm privileged to host or introduce today's session along with other colleagues. It's a joint initiative of the uh, intellectual property and digital subcommittees of the Law Council's business law section. And this is the fourth in a series of webinars that we are conducting for the benefit of all uh, Law Council committee members and indeed anyone else who would like to watch these seminars to provide education, particularly to the legal profession in relation to the way that artificial intelligence works and also the way that it's being applied in the business world and the legal issues that arise from all of those things so that we can collectively make more informed and sensible recommendations on law reform and policy, which is our role. Uh, today, we are moving into the topic of privacy and the implications that arise from the opportunities and uh, technologies relating to artificial intelligence and managing big data and um, machine learning and all the ways that um, we can do things that humans can't do on their own. Uh, we're very privileged to have two very informed speakers on this. Uh, the first is my colleague, Mark Vincent, who is also a principal at Spruce and Ferguson. Mark uh, is a leading lawyer in relation to not only intellectual property, but also matters around uh, information technology and privacy and, and data security. Uh, Mark's been involved in uh, the Privacy and Digital uh, Committee of the Inter sorry, the International Trademark Association Leadership Group for many years and uh, regularly advises clients on these issues. Uh, and from the industry side, we're very privileged to have Greg Stone, who currently works for Scala, which is an advisory firm in relation to these issues. Scala regularly advises uh, C-suites and businesses throughout Southeast Asia and Australia and New Zealand in relation to their opportunities to make use of AI and related technologies in leveraging and creating data that's useful to businesses in a very practical way. And Greg's got a history of working for a large business, Arup, and before that, Microsoft, in relation to um, applying these types of technologies in a very practical way. Uh, Mark and Greg will handle the presentation together. Just as a housekeeping thing, we have the chat turned off, but the Q&A function turned on today. And uh, we are a bit time limited in this webinar as we have been in the previous one. So we'll keep questions till the end, but please post them at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window and uh, time permitting, we'll address those at the end. So with that, I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks very much, Duncan. Um, I will um, get the slides up. Yes, yeah, so um, it's um, a privilege to be able to um, present on an important topic um, to members of the Law Council. Um, I know that many um, members of the different committees uh, will be uh, playing an important role uh, over, over coming, coming years in terms of how Australia frames its response to um, the, the challenges that are put forth um, through um, new uses of technology um, and uh, so-called artificial intelligence. Um, we're aware of the suite of talks around AI and um, for, for this um, talk today we've, um, we've focused in on the, the, the particular challenges that AI um, is going to pose for personal privacy um, and uh, uh, how various uh, countries and organisations around the world are approaching um, the, the challenges that AI poses to privacy regulation um, and really laying some groundwork at a, at a broad level um, so that you could see um, the, the various uh, policy-based options that are available to countries like Australia as they navigate uh, a future, um, there'll be an important balance between whether they double down on um, this, the, um, the central role of personal information to the point where they undermine 
the power of AI um, to, to do anything or, or for AI businesses to get off the ground um, or, or whether um, uh, Australian regulators and policymakers um, adopt a, a flexible approach, trying to understand the particular harms that um, are caused by the new technology and be alert to uh, new approaches um, to dealing with new problems rather than uh, sticking to, in the case of privacy, a, a regulatory model that comes out of Germany from the 1970s and may already have real challenges in the current technical environment. Um, Greg Stone um, has, uh, as Duncan mentioned, uh, a really deep technical experience. Um, and, um, and I've been fortunate to talk to him about um, you know, all, all manner of technical um, uh, issues of the day for a couple of decades. But um, uh, that, that, that stems back to a time as Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft and then Head of Digital um, Services at Arup. Um, and uh, in, embracing the technology is, is one part, has been one part of his role, but also communicating that to people like us and people like executives um, has, al has always been uh, you know, a key part of his role. So um, I hope we do get um, time for some questions at the end because he's got a wealth of experience to draw on that, uh, that, that diverges from the experience that we lawyers may have. So I think Greg's going to set the scene um, for, for the discussion today. Um, and um, he's also going to come back in toward the the end of the discussion around the role of standards, um, which he's also got extensive experience in, in the standard setting um, uh, practices around the world and what role they could play in relation to navigating these issues for artificial intelligence. So Greg, I'll hand over to you um, now. Yeah, look, thanks, Mark. Hopefully the microphone's working and, and everyone can hear. Um, one of the key things I think we're seeing at the moment is with all these sort of changes is the hype cycle. But one of the one of the things I wanted to really pull out was the fact that um, we really do face a paradigm shift at the moment. A number of key commentators are, are making this point, and I think it's worthwhile starting you know our discussions with that. Um, current the current AI via, via these large language models, which essentially provide a kind of a core upon which we can rapidly build uh, more, more targeted uh, artificial intelligence isn't simply a linear progression from what we've had before with either big data or the, the machine learning that, that, that came before. And we need to really recognize that we're moving from classifying things and you know, taking action on them as you would uh, say in a, a medical diagnosis uh, to actually creating content, to creating things. And this is the piece I think which is really, really pertinent to this whole area of security and privacy. Um, there's a lot of concern out there. So the concern's not coming from you know, one quarter or one set of vested interests either, all those vested uh, against it, but it's actually coming from practitioners and coming from the corporate area. Practitioners, uh, a number of key ones have already, uh, you'd probably be aware of, have already come out. Those have engaged for multiple decades and are prime leaders in the field and really called out that this is something that needs to be uh, taken a pause and re really addressed properly. One of the things that they ran as a, a survey recently with about, I think it was uh, 700 uh, people in the field. And the stats are horrifying. You know, 50% of researchers believe there's a 10% chance that AI will make humanity extinct. Now, that sounds pretty inflammatory until you look at the original question, which was actually pretty well, uh, well couched. And what it clearly showed was that, you know, who would, as one person remarked in a presentation I saw, who would get on a plane where there's a 10% chance of it falling out of the sky and being catastrophically, uh, you know, uh, problematic for those who are sitting in it, um, if 50% of the engineers believed that that was a possibility. I don't think we would be comfortable with that level of risk. Similarly, um, corporate concern, Samsung joins a, you know, group of others who have really essentially banned generative AI at work until they get a handle on what's happening. So it's an area that's labile, uh, rapidly, rapidly evolving. And we fundamentally think that there's a new class of responsibility required when you get this kind of generational change in the way that technology is 
is going to impact our society and is already impacting it. Some things to ponder um, that Mark and I, when we talked about, I thought might be useful as kind of things to hang in your head uh, as we all ponder uh, this area. AI is teaching itself now. So in the days when you would have, you know, supervised learning and we would have to see, if you like, guide the artificial intelligence to learn, we're now seeing a situation where actually they're learning themselves. They're setting up multiple nodes, they're contesting, and they're coming up with the best approach. You know, an earlier example of that was Go, um, where AI was essentially set loose with, you know, billions of different Go games uh, with many millions of nodes and figured out the best ways to actually win that. And very rapidly, they became, became proficient at it. Um, it's unpredicted uh, behavior is a real concern and a very unexpected one. Relatively recently, given the size of the models and the complexity of them, the practitioners themselves are starting to see unpredicted emergent behavior and capabilities that were never designed in and were never imagined could actually exist through the way that they were constructed. A good example that was given recently was a model that was trained in English to do a certain thing. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, found the ability to be perfectly fluent and translate in another language uh, that it was never programmed or modeled to, to do. Um, and many other behaviors likewise are starting to emerge that are, are potentially challenging. Identity theft um, through generative AI models is something I think we've seen in, in the press a fair bit, but it's very real and it, it presents a different conundrum to our experience with being able to neatly lock information in a specific form in a database and put the kinds of protections on those that we've done in the past with you know, relative success to a point now where actually you know that information is a set of probability relationships across data within a very, very complex model. Uh, that is a different conundrum altogether. Um, and then the last one, of course, is the concentration of power that's starting to evolve quite rapidly with those that wish to build platforms uh, or build into their pl existing platforms, AI services and house and keep developing those core, what they call foundation models, uh, which are extremely expensive to build in terms of compute power and, and people uh, and make that essentially a service that others can build on in a much more practical, rapid manner. That concentration of power brings with it its own uh, sets of challenges. Mark, perhaps the next slide. Um, the other one is, okay, so given all that, how prepared are we and in what way? A lot of the things that we've had to deal with thus far have really been um, able to be built on the kinds of security models that we've had in the past. And many of those have, have had at their core the tried and true uh, triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, really around the notion that who can get the info, um, can you make sure it doesn't change, um, and can actually we get our hands on the stuff we want to and in, in the form that we want to. All of those three are now absolutely being challenged by artificial intelligence. Confidentiality, um, the encryption algorithms, the way that that can be accessed, et cetera, is rapidly changing. And of course, then you have the deep fakes and other uh, synthetic uh, changes that can be brought about, which bring with their own challenges. Same with integrity. And of course, availability, we, we have a tradition of being able to rehydrate, if you like, existing or previous um, algorithms in order to achieve the same outcome that's premised on having a discrete set of data to do it. With these models, they are changing and developing and becoming more sophisticated literally by the minute. And so the ability to reconstitute in an, perhaps in an audible fashion, that which you did even a short while ago becomes really problematic. And therefore, if you're relying on the ability to do that as a means of availability, likewise problematic. So the kinds of um, things that we used to control, manage these challenges, um, again, are brought into question. The existing tools that we have really require a review. The sorts of um, things, the average corporate and government kit bag, for example, of encryption, ID access, um, security by obscurity, <laughs> being a, a commonly used one, um, 
are not up to the task. And more particularly, one of the biggest vectors for a number of the um, security issues has been social engineering attacks where someone has sent, you know, a fake mail or they've been, uh, there's, a, there's a hoax um, that's happened uh, via a phone or other means in order for them to give away information uh, that, that's valuable. That's now becoming flawless, certainly the potential to make it flawless in a way that's never been uh, before. And so that aspect of privacy, uh, you giving away that which you may not believe you are giving away to whom um, you're giving it away, it changes rapidly. So what does this mean for privacy and for society's uh, new, new responsibilities? Uh, and uh, Mark, I'll leave you to grab that and take it through its paces. Thanks, Greg. Um, so we were, we were thinking of some good uh, practical examples to, to, to make um, some of the privacy challenges apparent um, to you today. And, um, and one of the sort of standout um, candidates was a product of Clearview AI. Um, Clearview AI um, scrape um, facial images from the internet and um, they use facial recognition technology to provide um, uh, identification services at its core. Um, the material which I have up on screen is taken from the Australian National Phase patent, um, which Clearview AI have filed. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of it's a little bit more revealing than some of the marketing material on their website because they discuss in a bit more detail how their technology works and what they wanted a patent for. Um, and I've extracted just a few elements from that patent specification that, that show how they were going about using AI and the sort of challenges that, that gave rise to from a privacy perspective. So their, their product was a method for providing information about a person. Now that could be an unknown person, a newly met person, a person with a deficient memory, a criminal, an intoxicated person, a drug user, a homeless person. Now it was considered by the author of the, whoever was instructing the author of the, <laughs> the patent specification that there are all reasonable times when you're going to want to immediately know who it is you're coming across, depending on your role. And then the, the facial recognition data that was used to, um, uh, to, to train their AI images were ones which they downloaded via a web crawler. Um, I, I pause there. Um, the Australian Privacy Commissioner um, found that they had 3 billion images um, uh, in their database. Um, but there was also evidence when this came before the Australian Privacy Commissioner, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, that their plan was to have 30 billion different images of, of individuals, largely obtained through um, web, web crawling and, and video and so forth. So they really, their aim is to have photos of and images of everyone in the world. So the, the, the facial recognition data, um, can include uh, images from the internet, professional websites, law enforcement websites, Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, in some cases, it could be criminal records associated with the facial image. So they, they did target this to law enforcement. Um, they would also access the uh, online profile of the subject on social networking websites, professional networking websites, employer websites, um, and um, in real time, they make um, identity and personal information available to someone using their system. Um, uh, you, you could also set it to simply alert you um, to someone who posed a risk to the public. Um, for example, if you're deciding who comes in or out of your nightclub or who comes in and out of your office, who comes in and out of your country, you know, this type of profiling is, is quite useful. You, you might find that um, the computer thinks that they're dangerous. Um, they, they then said in some embodiments, the facial image data uh, would include the people around the person who the photos of, a so-called second subject. And they said um, in some embodiments of the way their machine works, uh, will identify a relationship between two or more subjects uh, who have uh, facial images uh, captured in a single image. So every time there's a group photo, um, they, they add layers and layers of information about the relationships an individual has to others and whether that leads to adverse inferences. 
Um, they then, um, their, their technology was around comparing vector representations of captured facial images to uh, effectively to vector representations of images on the database. So they had a way of sort of taking all of these measurements in the picture at the top right of the screen and making sure it was the same person or at least they had a reasonable degree of um, comfort it was. Um, that could be done with machine learning or AI. Um, and they went through a couple of different AI techniques that they used to make sure that their system got better and better and went off and did all of this um, improvement and gathering by itself. They don't need to send it out to scrape more images. It, it will do so permanently and forever. And it will constantly get better at making these connections between people and these identification points. They also um, wish to include a liveness gesture. And some of this has been being worked on by computer games companies and so forth, where, where you, you have certain gestures in live videos and, uh, and they can be used um, uh, to, uh, you know, to identify people as well. So it's not simply, simply a face um, that, that will be used to identify someone um, from a video image. Now, some of their promotional material is that um, it's been helping uh, in the war in Ukraine. Um, and when people come up to a Ukrainian checkpoint, um, the Clearview system is used to um, immediately identify the person and find out whether they're Russian special forces or whether they're a, an honest Ukrainian citizen wanting to cross a checkpoint. Um, they're also using it to identify bodies over there um, and, and, and work out who, uh, who people are. Um, where they have images of people involved in war crimes, you know, the story goes on. They've got a positive story to tell there from the Ukrainians' perspective. They also um, made um, a lot of um, a big deal on their website as to how law enforcement in the US found this very useful after the January 6 uh, riots at the US Capitol, um, uh, where Clearview were able to um, identify individuals who thought that they were um, anonymous through their obscurity, to use words from Greg's slide. Um, uh, they, they were no more anonymous through their obscurity. They, everyone who has an image is available for identification. Now, you might well say, well, that's an example of AI. What are the privacy implications? Well, we could, we could all probably think of privacy implications for a tool like this. It's incredibly powerful. Um, uh, the Australian Privacy, the Australian Information Commissioner has already considered for us um, what the implications uh, are for a system like this uh, under Australian privacy law. And this gives rise to the question, you know, are our laws adequate to deal with AI? And well, if you look at the analysis of the Clearview product, um, they're perfectly adequate. The Clearview product is unlawful. It has no possible way of complying with Australia's privacy laws. Um, so uh, Clearview have this proposition that they're not uh, scraping personal information, um, they're scraping public information that people put out there because they, uh, they intend for it to be publicly known. Um, they, they post their own photos and they live with it. Um, they said it's a mere solicitation of business transactions that they're involved in. Um, they're, they're not, um, uh, they're, they're, they're not um, uh, scraping uh, images uh, uh, in a way which uh, is taking personally identifiable information. Um, the uh, commissioner said that the covert collection of biometric information, i.e. The, the image, uh, carries a significant risk of harm to individuals, which includes harm from misidentification of a person by law enforcement, um, which could lead to loss of rights, freedoms and reputational damage. Also a risk of identity fraud that could flow from a data breach involving the biometric information. So if clearly you have the world's biggest collection of biometric information and the hackers get into it, well, um, the, the tools of, um, of identity theft are, are handed over. Um, they, had a, they had a big problem um, under Australian privacy law in showing that there was consent to the, of the user to the collection of what is sensitive information under the Australian um, Privacy Act. Um, and the commissioner said consent may not be implied if the intent is ambiguous or if there's reasonable doubt about the individual's intention. And this would apply to collecting personal information from any AI model 
that scrapes data from the public internet, including chat GPT and a lot, a lot of other products. They're trained on public, publicly available data sets. One of the big problems with privacy law is consent. And the commissioner had a look at consent in the case of Clearview scraping activities and, and said that the act of uploading an image to a social media site does not unambiguously indicate agreement, the collection of that image by an unknown third party for commercial purposes. Uh, in, in fact, the expectation is actively discouraged by many uh, public facing policies that prevent scraping. Uh, moreover, consent is certainly not inferred where the image is uploaded by someone else, i.e. the two people in one image, or where uh, an individual inadvertently posts content on a social media website um, uh, without changing the public default settings, so they weren't aware that it was being scraped. You would also have uh, children um, uh, whose images are on the internet, uh, people with disabilities are unable to understand the, the, the terms whose images are there, and the information commissioner would have none of the fact that, that none of the argument that, um, that, that there isn't some implicit consent. Um, the determination um, led to a clear finding of failure to meet um, uh, a number of the Australian privacy principles. And I'll pick them up on the, on the next slide. So this is, we're, we're looking at the challenges to privacy law. Uh, well, on the one hand, you've got the challenges to privacy by the use of AI. And then you have um, uh, the challenge to anyone using AI of complying with privacy laws. Um, and I think that's, that's a bigger problem at the moment. Anyone deploying an AI solution <clears throat> has a significant difficulty in ensuring compliance with um, privacy laws. Um, the, the red or orange, sorry, the orange circles are essentially the findings of the Privacy Commissioner from the Clearview example. Um, Clearview failed to implement systems to ensure compliance with the Australian privacy principles. Uh, they failed to get consent from people when they uploaded their sensitive biometric information. Um, they failed to make sure that they collected uh, data by lawful and fair means. Um, they provided no notice of the collection of personal information at or around about the time of collection. Um, uh, I, I put over here another significant um, uh, threat to privacy compliance that did not arise necessarily in the in the determination of the information commissioner, but AI gives rise to this um, significant potential of re-identification of people um, where you think that they're not, that the, the information you hold is not personal information. And that re-identification could happen with, with automated routines um, using uh, artificial intelligence. So um, look, I think the Australian Privacy Act, does that need um, further development to protect individuals? Maybe not, there's quite a lot there. <laughs> and, and there's just recently, um, and this won't have affected the Clearview um, scenario, but uh, you probably all be aware, or, or maybe you are, that uh, late last year, um, Australia passed um, legislation to introduce um, some of the, uh, uh, the highest potential penalties in the world for um, uh, serious privacy breach. Um, uh, and $50 million is, uh, uh, is the headline number that, that caught the headlines. There's other formulations for how an award would be arrived at. But um, the potential fines in Australia, if, say, Clearview ignored the findings of the commissioner and then started up again in Australia, um, the potential for significant fines is, is there now in Australia. Um, if you look to how are other countries dealing with this sort of conflict between AI and the privacy of individuals, um, there's a diversity of approaches. Um, on the one hand, over in Europe, they're doubling down on, um, on privacy. Um, and I've seen some commentators say it's a bit like um, an analogy where you say, well, um, people often die in car accidents uh, or they're um, permanently impaired. Um, it poses a great threat to um, the community. So let's ban cars. Um, and, uh, you know, you could take a, a similar approach to your privacy. Uh, anything which 
um, which could potentially cause harm to individuals through use of their personal information, um, should be regulated, should be prohibited. In Europe, um, the regulators uh, have moved to regulation of anonymized profiles. Um, so for a long time, the ad tech industries have built up profiles of shoppers or of potential shoppers, uh, and they don't need to know who they are. There's nothing, no personal information about it. Um, you just need to know that it's a, uh, you know, uh, a, a 45 year old uh, male that is in the market for um, some new hiking equipment, a 52 uh, year old female that's in the market for a new electric car, and you're away. You, you know, you've got the information you need to uh, to sell the ads, um, and you know that the the ads will get. Um, uh, eagerly, eagerly snapped up by the consumers who are introduced to new opportunities to part with their money. That's, you know, Google's model um, and, and many others in the ad tech industry. Um, the European regulators are saying, well, that's a profile and sometimes a very, very detailed profile. That's not just those superficial facts I mentioned. There might be a very detailed profile of a person. The only thing it lacks is the connection to a, to a particular individual, leaving aside re-identification issues. Um, and the Europeans say, well, that, that's valuable. That's someone's property. It doesn't matter that you haven't said, you haven't said, well, that's Mark or that's Greg. Um, it is Mark and Greg as economic um, units. You are selling it. Uh, it is valuable and it belongs to the individuals and they're regulating it. Um, now that's a step further than other regulators have gone. They've also introduced a right not to be subject to automated decision-making uh, with legal effects if consumers don't wish to be. Um, and the Europeans have also introduced um, back in the introduction of the GDPR, um, a right to be forgotten, um, which poses difficulties for people deploying um, AI solutions as well. When you go to an organization and say, I'd like you to remove all information that you hold about me. Uh, and effectively, I, I wanna be satisfied that you know nothing about me. Um, and that becomes harder and harder to implement as a solution and they just run right in the face of AI solutions. And the Europeans are saying, well, we value privacy above the right of corporations to uh, deploy these models and develop these models. Arguably, that's meant that Europe has not been the, um, the center of um, many waves of technological advancement over the last few decades. It's um, uh, the Americans, uh, it's the Chinese. Uh, that's where the big, big tech companies are coming out of. And maybe it's a regulatory environment. And I think regulators are pausing to think about the, the dual balance that they want to strike between protecting of the rights of individual citizens and the expectations of individual citizens um, and participating in the new commercial opportunities that come from AI and also the new um, uh, geopolitical strategic benefits that come from being a leader in the area of uh, AI. And that's not lost. There's an arms race of AI, including uh, AI for, um, uh, for, for use in the military, um, uh, where uh, the ideal is that you don't have um, living soldiers, you have uh, autonomous um, AI-based uh, lethal weapons that go out and do the job of soldiers. Um, so that's taking an extreme, um, but you'll have computers able to make their own decisions about the use of lethal force in relation to people. Um, so the potential of this technology as a, as a strategic um, uh, issue for nations is not lost, whether it's economic uh, or whether it's military. Um, California is interesting um, as another example in this part of the discussion. So I mentioned that in Europe, they're sort of doubling down on the right of the consumer California did do a mini GDPR for the US and they were out, out ahead, of, um, ahead of many other US states. The US has no um, single privacy regulation. Um, it's, it's very much um, uh, a patchwork of, uh, of state-based regulation. And in some respects, a bit like Australia, I know we have a National Privacy Act, but we've also got a patchwork of state-based regulations that are relevant. Um, it doesn't make it so easy for for, for um, companies to ensure compliance. Um, the reason I mentioned California here is because although they had a fairly um, sophisticated, well, they had a fairly um, uh, aggressive piece of legislation to protect the rights of consumers to their personal information, 
um, they've been working on carve outs to that. Um, and one carve out is for aggregated information or anonymized information. That's not personal information. So it's so a contrast with the, the, the approach of the regulator in Europe that says, well, no, no, that's still about a person. Um, the Americans say, well, a little bit more practical. Um, what would happen to Google <laughs> uh, if, if we said that was personal information? You know, a little bit, you know, a little bit more um, realistic given the number of tech companies based in California. They've also got a carve out for publicly available information scraped from the internet. And they say no notice is required at the point of collection. And you know, that, that would be highly relevant to a company like Clearview, but also ChatGPT, the open AI products. Um, I think the regulators there have, they're, they're very close to a lot of powerful tech lobbyists. Uh, and they can recognize some of these fundamental conflicts with um, our traditional approaches to privacy regulation that that really sort of emerged and spread out of Europe. Uh, and they're open to the idea that they need some tweaking to, to be um, better suited to allow the development of AI models. And um, what do I think are the challenges uh, to privacy law compliance from AI? Um, I think that the whole idea of consent um, as a basis or as the primary basis for an individual making available their information online is completely flawed. Um, no one reads, uh, I don't know, um, I'm a lawyer, I know what they mean. Um, uh, uh, I could read and understand um, every notification that comes up. I read none of them. I click, I agree, and I move on. Um, and I think most users are the same. The, the idea that that is a, um, uh, a well-considered and, and thoughtful process is, is false. Um, uh, also, um, you may put information in up on in one setting. So someone, you know, I put up a put up a photo of a family barbecue, but you know, I, I didn't know that I was causing everyone to be linked together for Clearview's purposes when they're um, you, you know, um, putting images in the hands of uh, Russian soldiers and I've got uh, an extended Ukrainian family and uh, th there we go. Whatever the unintended um, use that could be made of information that's put up on the internet is, is, is seldom going to be something that someone thought they were consenting to at the time they did something seemingly innocent. Um, I think the, the, um, uh, uh, these anonymous data sets are going to become uh, more and more sophisticated. Um, and I already mentioned that these anonymous profiles are, are very, um, uh, are very detailed. Uh, I do have one client that, um, that takes uh, uh, a client database for large corporations, um, takes all the personal information out of that data set. And then based on certain parameters, which are not um, personal information, um, proceeds to tag the, um, the database with up to 500 different fields of data that, that could relate to, to an individual and their profile. But um, uh, the use of AI heralds an era where, where all information uh, about an individual could be known, uh, falling short of um, linking to their actual name or their actual address. So um, I think that's an area where the Californians and the Europeans differ, but it's it's one that I, the current privacy regulation just doesn't doesn't really deal with it at the moment. Certainly not in Australia. This also the security by obscurity. The old idea. Well, I've got nothing to worry about walking past a hundred cameras on the way to work and um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's that's going to come to an end. Um, you are no longer obscure because every obscure person in the world um, can be uh, profiled, analyzed, assessed in, in potential new um, commercial models, security models, et cetera. Um, so I say a failure to adapt privacy regulation to the new technology. One of the risks is creating disincentives for AI-based innovation, which would have an impact on um, our, uh, our, our, our ability to take advantage of productivity improvements um, in Australia. Um, and I think that has to be carefully weighed against 
um, the perceived or actual harms to individual privacy. And I think that there is a, a call for not acting too quickly. Um, now, um, one of the ways we could judge um, uh, how we should react is to look at the situation across the globe on AI. Um, there's regulation um, popping up everywhere. Um, there's an article um, in April's Economist uh, in which um, two guest writers pitch for an international agency uh, to, uh, to govern artificial intelligence. Uh, something like a World Bank or or a UN, or um, and they believe that the, the time is right for the countries of the world to unite and and give up some sovereignty to um, another international body. I, I you know I think from from my impressions, you know the world has drifted a long way from the desire to ceding sovereignty over issues like this to another UN style body. Um, but the problem which was identified is that in the last year alone, they found 37 regulations mentioning AI passed around the globe. Um, and it's really difficult for uh, people developing new AI models to try to deal with compliance in that environment. And it's going to hold back the development of AI. They wanted some international standards or international approach so that the world's not held back. Uh, nor is the world put at significant risk because there's, you know, there's an international body looking at significant risks. That that's one one approach. You know that that everyone, all players in the world, get together and have sufficient common interest that these issues are resolved. Exceedingly unlikely. I think we'll have a uh, uh, we'll have an uneven loophole ridden patchwork for the foreseeable future, much like we have had with privacy regulation. That said. Where should Australia sit in that um, loophole-ridden patchwork? Um, one country that is pressing ahead uh, in a in an, with a rapid uh, pace is China. Uh, they're one of the two leading nations in the world with AI. They aim to lead the world in AI. They've been acquiring AI-based businesses and technologies for a decade. It's a core principle. Um, uh, it was a core project and a core objective uh, of China to lead the world, uh, both in um, uh, AI technologies, but also in the models for regulating artificial intelligence. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the Chinese uh, activity around um, AI regulation. And um, uh, I think those looking to to uh, understand how Australia might approach AI could do worse than following China's approach closely. Now, now China will have a slightly different focus to say Europe. In Europe, the individual sits right at the center of all protections. Um, in China, and this February 2019 quote, um, uh, actually the, um, the September 2021 20, quote at the bottom right makes the, um, uh, makes makes the point well in terms of the slightly different focus in China. They say content generated by future AI products must reflect the country's core socialist values and not encourage subversion of state power. Uh, the draft law said AI content must not promote discrimination based on ethnicity, race and gender and should not provide false information. Um, they do have ethical principles that, that which is a common thread for um, for nations that that are seeking to um, to, to press ahead with AI. Um, they're seeking to, uh, to adopt an ethical framework, much like the frameworks used to make decisions about use of medical technology. Um, and so uh, I put this February 2019 quote um, in which the Artificial um, Intelligence National Governance Committee said that they wish to promote the healthy development of a new generation of AI to better coordinate the relationship between development and governance, ensure that AI is secure, reliable, and controllable, promote economically, socially, and ecologically sustainable development, and jointly build a community of common destiny for humanity. And, and certainly the Chinese are active in trying to reach uh, understandings um, outside of China on the governing principles that should apply to AI. They're, they're, they're not trying to go it alone. Um, the November 2022 um, extract that I have down the bottom is interesting, and it's the approach I have some um, sympathy with and I recommend that an AI governance framework 
uh, make use of different governance methods and tools, such as ethical principles, norms and specifications, standards and laws, and put them under the agile governance methodology. Now, I'd never heard of an agile governance methodology before, although I'd heard of an agile um, approach to coding in computer technology projects, you know, whereby you're given as much flexibility as possible to adapt. And it looks like the Chinese are hovering around um, their regulation. Um, they're putting forth principles. They're putting forth some laws where they've carefully considered um, the, the, the timing and the content of the law, but they're taking their time to get it right. They believe that there's a role for, for, for ethics, norms, specifications, standards, and laws, and to keep it flexible. To keep, to keep accepting what they know and what they don't know, to keep taking into account the, the global geopolitical um, position. Um, a model which um, I would um, suggest we could learn a lot from is from our own region um, in Singapore. In 2019, um, Singapore launched its model AI governance framework. In 2020, they put out a second edition and they've added some tools. So they have an implementation and self-assessment guide that's very detailed, very useful. They've been putting forward a compendium of use cases where they go through uh, Singaporean organizations which use AI and, uh, and make a public example of how they go about um, meeting the governance framework um, and meeting the objectives of the Singaporean um, framework. Um, they also have an annex, which is foundational AI ethical principles, which I include in these slides. Um, one of the um, objectives of that framework, which makes sense from a compliance perspective, is that the privacy regulator in Singapore says, well, yes, if you adopt the AI governance framework and implement it, um, that's gonna satisfy us that you have taken reasonable efforts to align your policies, structures, and processes with accountability-based practices in data management and protection, which is a core of compliance with their privacy law. So they've, they've sought to find a path through for their corporations um, to demonstrate privacy compliance. Um, and, and really that's the key. I think you've got to find a path through for corporations rather than say, yeah, it's a mess, uh, good luck. Um, that, that's not, it's not really um, providing the sort of um, leadership that would be necessary to encourage development in this space. Now, um, I, I'll mention the fact that there's, um, there's various approaches to, um, uh, to distilling ethics-based principles globally, but not for long because I want Greg to talk about standards in a moment. Um, I, I found a study in which 84 different um, publications uh, containing ethics principles uh, were, were studied and, uh, and, and the, top, the top, uh, top principles were identified, transparency, justice and fairness, non-maleficence, responsibility, privacy, beneficence, freedom and autonomy, trust, sustainability, dignity, solidarity. And you won't spend long looking through approaches to um, governance and AI to see that some collection of ethics principles or other um, underpins the approach recommended for every organization when they introduce AI into their organization. In the slides, in case they're shared, uh, there is the um, set of ethics principles that's in the Singaporean um, document, and they have, um, they have, uh, they have 12 ethics principles. Um, now, Greg, would you like to say a bit about standards? Sorry. Weakness of yep, hand. Got you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. I, I think you did a good job of raising what is starting to become, I think, a more than a thought bubble in a lot of people's heads, which is, this will. This is. There's no silver bullet to this. It requires the bringing together at, at various levels, whether it's legislation all the way down to some specific areas of standardisation um, guidance and mechanisms by which we can start to you know, guide the, the course and use of AI in a much better way. Just wanted to touch on standards. Um, before I did, though, I 
I thought it was worth also calling out because um, it's becoming more and more critical that we're starting to see the advances not only in the conventional compute really take off, particularly with AI specific chipsets um, that really amp up parallel processing and hence allow much greater computational heft, if you like, to be brought to bear on the models that themselves are developing in terms of efficiency and capability. But the other thing to keep as a marker in our minds as we're starting to think about how to regulate this is to consider the impact that quantum computing, when it does hit, um, will have on all of this because it will again bring another quite discontinuous set of changes to compute power. And as a result of that, once again, will probably cause us to sit back and figure out how we're going to tackle that. Um, a couple of words on standards, because they, tended, they have tended through the history of technology um, and other fields to become pretty important enablers, um, both of collaboration, but also innovation, surprisingly. And at the same time, they've also been things that have caused stagnation when they've been applied uh, too heavily or too vigorously. Um, they work best typically when technical change is low and when the adoption promises to be high. Um, the more directive you get with the standard, the less uh, likely it is to be picked up, but also it's less likely to be maintained as things develop quickly. Um, the other thing is the standard setting process is inherently consensus orientated. And so by its very nature, it tends to be slow rather than fast. And of course, you put that with a very fast changing um, field and there's a problem there. Nonetheless, standards have worked very, very well in specific situations, particularly when matched um, with the organizations that have been uh, used in order to bring them about and then have them popularized. So some questions that you know we'd want to consider, I think if we were wanting to bring standards in, um, what do we want to enable or prevent with the standards? And what do we actually want to achieve as an outcome from them? So for example, when uh, you might want to look at standardizing the encoding of information to facilitate interoperability, web services were all about that. And so therefore the standards themselves, depending on the part, the level of the stack that they were applied, were very much tailored at achieving that particular out outcome. And the other thing is where in the ecosystem should this occur? So, you know, on one hand, you've got, you know, low level specs that can constrain things in activity, like, uh, well, we're going to present our information to this calling application using JSON, which is a standard. Um, or do we actually keep it at some of the levels that Mark was uh, hinting at, where you say, well, actually like ISO 31000 risk management, it's about a framework and there's a lot of flexibility within that, but there are, some, there are sufficient guide rails around how things should progress and how you should operate in order to ensure yourself uh, safe or, or, or risk uh, appropriate in any particular part of your, your enterprise. Um, the other thing is then, what is the best mechanism when you decided on a standard to advance that? You know, everyone would be familiar with IS, ISO, IEC, which has been instrumental in a number of critical standards over the years, they've also, uh, it's also a national based consensus. Um, so each country has a vote. I used to sit on JTC1 here in, um, in Australia, and I can tell you it's, it's, it's pretty slow and pretty hard going. And um, so it can take many, many years to even get uh, things partially agreed. But nonetheless, when they are, they become uh, often embedded into a whole bunch of activity, including commercial contracts or at the other end of the scale, you can get industry consortia um, or even de jure standards, which, which crop up that people are, um, are, are using and they want to actually get formalized uh, better. And they can be a much faster approach. Uh, approach. Um, so again, worthwhile thinking about actually what channel is the best in order to bring these to market. As I suspect the faster, the better. And the last thing, I think it should be, how should these standards be rapidly adopted by users and organization? Um, one of the ways that we've done it in the past is a standard is created in terms of a best practice uh, for different complex parts of a standard set. 
Uh, and then a what's often called a basic profile is created, which essentially is a way of saying, you know what, there's a lot of complexity in here, but if you choose just do this very basic stuff here, uh, it will it will work. What you will send to me and what I will receive to you, for example, will work. And that provides a much easier on-ramp for people rather than a very onerous set of heavyweight specifications, which in the area of um, this particular field could eventuate. So those are just some things for, for us all to consider as we think about the role of standards within the broader framework of things that Mark uh, highlighted we will probably need. Thanks, Greg. Um, this this was uh, the last summary slide, and um, it, it's sort of a bit more practical. Um, uh, when I have clients through the door, um, how do we get compliance right with our AI project? Well, there's the, the standard um, advice I'd give under Privacy Act, you know, make sure you've got consent for the collection and use of the information, uh, conduct a privacy impact assessment of your project, um, make sure that you've thought about security and you've, um, you've, you've possibly applied a standard within your organisation to deal with, with security. Um, they're quite, quite sophisticated uh, approaches now to achieving that um, security. Um, uh, make sure that your privacy compliance is, is embedded um, in your corporate governance. Um, and then I, I thought, well, there'll, there'll be some, an additional list relating to the particular risks attached to AI that, uh, that I think arise specifically out of the nature of AI. Um, make sure that you spend extra time um, verifying the accuracy of your data sets. So um, if your data sets identify people, well, where did it come from? Um, was there consent? Is it accurate? Um, can we use it? Can we use it at all? Um, think about the data sets that are coming in. Um, document algorithms that are created and be able to explain the behavior that is um, uh, the, the behavior of the algorithm um, in use. Um, conduct risk assessments on these third party data sets. Uh, consistently consider and apply ethics principles. That's, you know, it first presupposes that an organization has study the various sets of ethical principles that might govern the use of AI and adopted some if, uh, and there are a number in, already in Australia put out by different organisations, uh, Singaporean government has its own, as I mentioned. And then make sure that there's a clearly defined chain of governance and accountability. It's all too common in large organisations for the buck to stop with no one. Um, and uh, make, make sure that there is a clear chain of governments, governance and accountability around AI projects. A lot of this was scratching the surface. Um, it's a big topic. Um, it's, um, and no doubt you'll hear more about specific elements of it as time goes on and the technology is um, in broader use. But uh, um, I think we're running close to the end of our time, Duncan, but I don't know if you've received any questions. Thanks, Mark and Greg. That was extremely thorough and efficient. Uh, we've got one minute remaining. We've had uh, one question come through on the Q&A. Uh, and I might roll that up into just a, a broader question, which seems to be about the tension or the, the different options that are emerging as between individual countries regulating themselves uh, versus an international discourse versus uh, moral questions about pulling back, perhaps, and what does that mean? And, um, and also this idea of self-regulation arising through the standards that you mentioned, Greg. Um, I wonder if you, you think any of these is likely to win out. For example, what would be the, the practical utility of say the West um, uh, giving into the um, suggestion from that petition that AI be subject to a moratorium for a period? Uh, what would that mean in the interim? Would that practically mean that just other people are looking at it in the meantime and things could arise unsupervised um, does self-regulation bring or standards bring some sort of benefit in the same way that you know being green, for example, is having its it's promoted as a virtue that you're compliant. Um, so have you got any sort of thoughts about that as we finish? Might go for you, Greg, first. It's it's a really vexed one. I've seen it come up in a number of different um, publications and, and podcasts and things. This this idea of well, hey, if we if we stop, you know 
the different parts of the world will, will gain the ascendancy. And I think there's a there's a truth in that. Um, by the same token, I think that, and Mark kind of touched on this um, and the work that China is already doing um, and pursuing, everyone's facing the same problem. Uh, it has diff different wrinkles and implications for whether or not you're a you know, democracy or a different form of government, but nonetheless, everyone's got the same concerns and challenges. So I think the, the, the call to kind of stop and pause it is, is a natural one, an understandable one. I think practically it's going to be very difficult, particularly when you've got large uh, multinational organizations that have a massive vested interest in continuing the development of that, um, albeit in the COPA way, and then unleashing it on people. Um, that That is a big problem. I think the key lies in this area of bringing together, well, okay, so given this cat is out of the bag and it's a it's a fairly powerful cat, um, how do we how do we actually manage it? So rather than sort of cauterizing the wound, how do we manage the bleed? Mm -hmm. And one final comment, Mark, just on Clearview AI, I understand from Loyally that there was an AAT decision delivered very, very recently within the last day or so, uh, which upheld some and some of the findings, but not all of them, but the overall decision against Clearview AI. So I commend that to anyone who wants to read more about it. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, I think we'll wrap up there. We're just a little bit over time. Uh, there's one more webinar to go, which is next week, um, and that's on AI and human rights. So look forward to seeing as many of you there as possible. We'll finish there. Thank you. <laughs>